everyone. This is Ashley Ellen Boss with Sky House Herb School and Apothecary. And today for Devotional Wednesday, I wanted to talk about the connection between nature and the divine. And why is it that nature for so many of us speaks to us in a way that certain religions or gospels or texts just don't. Uh, I feel like this is something that I really struggled with as a child growing up in the Catholic tradition, where, you know, it was just, it was very, there was a lot of ritual, a lot of strictness, and um, not a lot of room for questions and not a lot of space for creativity in religion. And so, uh, yeah, I ended up saying lots of Hail Marys, lots of our fathers, you know, I would go to confession and confess all of my sins, which at that time were mostly things like teasing my brother or stealing something from the store, which, you know, not great things to do, but pretty minor. Um, but did that, did that speak to me? And did that really inspire me to have a relationship with God? No, actually that for me pushed me in the opposite direction. It made me not want to go to church and made me feel like the God of my understanding was a cruel God who was uh, condemning, judgmental, um, who liked closed spaces and had lots of rule and rules and didn't like to have fun. <laughs> so for me, I, as a child, I turned to nature as my source of inspiration. And I don't think I'm alone. I'm guessing probably a lot of you listeners also had that experience where there's something about when you're outside surrounded by the woods, by trees and the songs of birds and deer and all sorts of animals. And that whole experience helps us to feel like we can understand our place among things. And so I'm going to be talking about Mary Oliver. I'm going to be reading from her book, Thirst. This is a beautiful collection of poems. If you're not familiar with Mary Oliver, I would strongly recommend that you read some of her work. Um, any book of hers is magical. And you know, one thing that I admire about Mary Oliver, I read this in her writer's handbook, was that every morning without fail, she would go out in the woods and she lived in, in New England. So, you know, pretty far up north and rain, snow, blizzard, hail, you know, whatever it was, she woke up every morning. That was her spiritual practice was going into the woods and walking and walking and walking. And one thing she wrote about in her writer's handbook is that she said, the thing about creativity in the muse of the writer is that if you let it sit for too long in idleness, it disappears. You have to go looking for it every day. You have to engage with it every day. And Elizabeth Gilbert writes about this too in her book. Oh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name. Um, it's about creativity. And I think it's something about big. I'll look it up. But she writes about... Um, she writes about how, yeah, like for her as a writer, that she has to stick with a book and see it all the way through. Otherwise, the idea will jump to another person. So it's really interesting to think about this idea that we have to do something regularly. We have to engage in something regularly. And it has to inspire us in order to hold our attention. And nature is one of the greatest things that's always changing. It's never the same. You know, the seasons change, the cycles change. Everything is constantly changing. And we can remember our sacred smallness, our smallness in this huge natural world. But even if we can move one pebble we can feel our greatness, you know, when we're out in the, for me in the garden and I do, you know, I do one shift of moving the plants in a certain way and they start to grow better. I feel like, you know, superhuman. So there's this great ability for nature to give us context of who we are and what we are and why we're here. And, you know, one thing that, that, I, you know, my husband and I always talk about is I'm, I'm such a romantic when it comes to nature. To me, you know, when I see nature, I just see all that's beautiful. I see all that's amazing and wonderful. And my husband, on the other hand, what he sees is, yes, he sees the beauty and, you know, the majesty of nature, but he also is like, and it's cruel. He's like, I've spent 
many ayahuasca ceremonies in the jungles and the jungles will eat people. They will eat you up. They, you know, like not everything is nice out there. And I'm like, well, I'm sure there, you know, it's not all mean and dark, but you know, the, the truth is, is that it's both. It's like nature both cares deeply for us. Have you ever had the experience where you've been like lost in the woods or you've gotten injured in the woods and somehow there's something about the grace of nature where you end up finding your way through. Like you get these little hints. It's like nature isn't trying to get you, but trying to help you. And I had this experience when I was surfing in the ocean in Costa Rica. This was many moons ago. And, um, you know, I got stuck in a really high, in really big waves and I was not equipped to surf these waves. And so I was taking the waves in and, you know, I, I had the experience that the waves were trying to kill me. Um, but after I did this, I did some really cool, um, it's called rapid eye movement therapy. Maybe you've heard of it before, but as I revisited this traumatic experience, kind of a, a near death experience because I broke ribs and I was stuck on the bottom of the ocean for a long time. <laughs> um, but as I relived it and went into this experience, I realized in some ways the ocean was just trying to push me to the shore. And I was, it was, I was resisting. It wasn't trying to kill me. It was trying to move me forward. So, you know, it, nature has this ability to give us so many chances for both redemption um, and then so many challenges to help us learn. Nature provides for us. Uh, nature takes things away. You know, if we think about storms and natural disasters, and, and this is an interesting one too, that I think is why we can find spirituality in nature is because nature really inspires us and it has the ability to completely devastate us. So on the one hand, we can look out, like I can look out right now, which I, my eyes keep going to the window because the, the maple trees are all of this beautiful radiant gold color with red streaks. And it's just beautiful today. Um, so there's this inspiration that we can find through the seasons, the metaphors, right? All of that. But then there's also the devastation that we experience. You know, um, if you've ever been outside when it's too cold and you're not equipped and you are like, I feel like I'm going to, you know, you know, you have that, like, I feel like I'm going to die or like my surfing experience or whatever, maybe your near death experience has been in nature. You know, you're like, this is potentially devastating, but here's an interesting thing. I love, I'm a geek about words. And I looked up the word devastate because I noticed that the word deva was in there. So the etymology of the word devastate from Latin, the word, the prefix D means completely or thoroughly or utterly. And then vestare, V-A-S-T-A-R-E comes from the Latin word, which means to lay complete, to lay to waste. So devastate in Latin is to completely lay something to waste. And so nature does that. Nature has the ability to both, to lay something completely to waste, you know, mudslides, earthquakes, all of those, those types of things. Um, even global warming, you know, this is happening. It's yes, our fault, but it's also part of what nature is, how nature is responding. And it's devastating in that way. But also in the word devastate is the word deva. And in Sanskrit, the word deva means good spirit. It's a very positive term. So there's like, you know, bad spirits or demons. And then there's good spirits or devas. They're godlike. They're these godlike expressions of goodness that are found in nature, are found, you know, found everywhere. So, you know, I, I just thought that was so interesting because it's like, you know, even in devastation, our devas are these good spirits trying to teach us something. And so, so many of us turn to nature and for these teachings, including great writers like Mary Oliver. So let me just read, I'm going to go back and forth between some poems and I want to pick this apart for our minds. So the first one is from her poem. Uh, it's called more beautiful than the honey locust tree are the words of the Lord. I had such a longing for virtue, for company. I wanted Christ to be as close as the cross I wear. I wanted to read and serve, to touch the altar linen. Instead, I went back to the woods 
where not a single tree turns its face away. Isn't that true? Why do we go to nature? Because nothing turns away from us. You know, in, in the church or in religion, you know, we can have people that judge us, you know, that look at us and say, mm, I don't think you're a good fit for this group, you know, or you also can just feel like, um, I'm not quite good enough to be here, you know, or uh, maybe I'm not a good fit for this group. And so there can be this, you know, with, with human interaction, there can be a lot of judgment, but here she says, instead, I went back to the woods. So she had already been there. She, it's like a returning. And so it, it's, it's a familiar place where not a single tree turns its face away, right? There's radical acceptance in nature. And I, I this is kind of a crazy thing um, that I did uh, a few weeks ago. So I, backstory is I went to see this, uh, this elder for some counsel uh, for my life right now, kind of in this transition place of my teaching and my work and my family and, and kind of everything. And she, she said, I want you to go dig a hole in the earth and bury yourself in it <laughs> and uh, cover yourself with earth and just lay there. I, I, I think that's going to be really good for you to get clarity and to help you kind of figure things out and get still. And I was like, okay, that was in January. And now here it is October. And so it was late September where there was um, big mounds of earth in my backyard, ready to be put, in, put into the planters. And um, I was talking with some friends about it and telling them about you know what this woman had said. And they said, you just need to do that. And I was like, no, it's crazy. And it was, and, it, and I did it. And I buried myself. I dug a hole in the earth. I buried myself up to my neck. And I laid there under the moonlight and the earth accepted me. She just took me in. I think that was the biggest takeaway was the earth just took me in and I could have laid there forever and she would have never pushed me away. There's something so beautiful and deep about that understanding that in death, the earth does not ever push us away. She always takes us back and always takes us in. And that's what we seek, isn't it? You know, in, in our spiritual lives is, what is going to be all accepting? What is going to take me for all of my wrinkles and, you know, all of my imperfections? Like who's going to love me even, even when no one else does? And Mary Oliver says, not a single tree turns its face away. So let me jump now to um, this beautiful passage of, of, I think, again, why we turn to nature. She says, this is from the same poem. Part one, in the household of God, I have stumbled in recitation and in my mind, I have wandered. I have interrupted worship with discussion. Once I extinguished the gospel candle after all the others, but never held the cup to my mouth lagging in gratitude. So here she's talking about her, her church experience she stumbled in recitation. Her mind has wandered. How many times have our minds wandered when we're trying to focus and meditate or do our spiritual work, do our japa? Um, I have interrupted worship with discussion. I remember in Catholic school, um, I would always have questions and, uh, and I would always get in trouble. I got in big trouble for that. Um, so, you know, she wanted to discuss um, even in, in a moment of worship, she wanted to talk. She wanted to have an, have a relationship, an interpersonal dialogue about what she was hearing. But that wasn't welcome here. But she said, I never held the cup to my mouth lagging in gratitude. So deep in her, even though she didn't fit into this particular place very well, she always knew she had gratitude. She goes on and says, the Lord forgives many things, so I have heard. The deer came into the field. I saw her, her peaceful face and heard the shuffle of her breath. She was sweetened by merriment and not afraid, but bold to say whose field she was crossing. Spoke the tap of her foot. It is God's and mine. Right? <laughs> But only she, but only that she was born into the poem that God made and called the world. So how beautiful, you know, again, she, she goes to nature. 
the next line, she goes to nature, the deer in the field, her peaceful face, sweetened by merriment, not afraid. And she was bold enough to say whose field she was crossing. She said, it is God's and mine. And so I think in the creatures of nature, in the deer, in the fox, in the raven, we get this sense of this share, shared world that we're living in this poem of God's creation. And that it is not just God's world, but it is mine, she says. It is God's and mine, said the deer. And so is this world both God's and ours? And what if we lived that way? You know, what if we were able to live in that poem? Ah, I just love that. So then let me go back. She said, um, instead I prayed, oh Lord, let me be something useful and unpretentious. Even the cobblestone has a task to do and do it well. Because I think when we spend time in nature and we see everything doing its purpose, you know, it's, I, I remember when I first learned about the word Dharma and one of the, the meanings of Dharma is the be, the beingness of something. So it's like the purpose, it's like the mountain's purpose is to stand and be a mountain. The bird's Dharma is to sing and to fill the, 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 the air with song. And, um, you know, in, in yoga, they say, and the human's purpose is to love God. <laughs> um, but here, Mary Oliver's asking, she says, you know, let me be something, you know, because I think we so often say, well, what am I supposed to be? Even the cobblestones have a task to do and they do it well. So what, what is it that I am here to do? And nature gives us so many clues. If we really pay attention, if we really spend time outside, um, she provides the inspiration, the insights, the clues. My friend and I were talking the other day about breadcrumbs, you know, on the path of life. Like what if the breadcrumbs never end? Like what if, the, you know, we always think about, oh, well, we'll know our purpose one day. One day it'll all become clear. Or if you follow the breadcrumbs, they'll, they'll lead you to that final place that you're supposed to be, right? Your destiny. But what if the breadcrumbs never end? What if you're 92 and you're still excitedly following the breadcrumb trail as to what to do next. You know, Lord, let me be something useful and unpretentious. You know, what if just asking that question is enough? What if that's, you know, she says, instead I prayed, oh Lord, let me be something useful and unpretentious. I mean, what if that in itself is the answer? Let me be something, let me be. Maybe we just need to be more and, and, and let God show us the way, you know, one wave at a time, uh, one hole in the earth at, at a time, you know, one sickness and cold at a time. Like, what if that's, what if that's it? So now I want to go forward to a poem. This one's called The Place I Want to Get Back To. <clears throat> because this is where I think it all heads. The place I want to get back to is where in the pine woods, in the moments between the darkness and first light, two deer came walking down the hill. And when they saw me, they said to each other, okay, this one is okay. Let's see who she is and why she is sitting on the ground like that so quiet, as if asleep or in a dream, but anyway, harmless. And so they came on their slender legs and gazed upon me, not unlike the way I go out to look at the dunes and look and look into the faces of the flowers. And then one of them leaned forward and nuzzled my hand, and what can my life bring to me that could exceed that brief moment? For 20 years, I have gone every day to the same woods, not waiting exactly, just lingering. Such gifts, 
bestowed cannot be repeated. If you want to talk about this, come to visit. Come visit me. I live in the house near the corner, which I have named Gratitude. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, it just gets me. Because the, the title of that poem is the place I want to get back to, right? How many of us have moments like that, just magical beyond measure? And, you know, we go back again and again and again, trying to recreate that one magical moment. And it never happens. How much time do we, do we waste uh, is one thought. But, but then also what reverence we cultivate when we remember so deeply what has touched us from the natural world. Um, could you even imagine a deer coming up and nuzzling your hand? I mean, that doesn't happen, guys, very often. I mean, she's, Mary Oliver was a special person, and she was a woman who, as a spiritual practice, went to the woods every single day and wrote every single day. She didn't miss a day, um, except for extreme illness, <clears throat> but even in blizzards. And, you know, that dedication, that is being that's who she was meant to be and that's what she was doing and that's what she did with her life and you know did Barry Oliver ever get was there a final place that she was trying to reach or was she just you know I think she said in one of her poems I want to be a, a bridegroom to astonishment you know uh, she wanted to be married to the wonder of the world and to, and to walk the aisle with wonder every day as she walked through the woods. And I just feel like that's what so many of us crave and want is to feel that closeness to God. You know, it's like the, the things we wear, I have a rose and a star. Um, people wear crosses and they wear Krishna and, you know, um, all sorts of different emblems that are close and we just we just want God to be so close but it's just sometimes feels like it's so far away and uh and so we we turn to the thing that doesn't turn away from us we turn to nature so <clears throat> I don't think I have a tidy bow for this one but I will say that uh I'm going into nature today I'm, I'm gonna go out into the woods with my dogs and walk in silence and just let the wind blow through my hair. And for a while, I'm going to not think about anything that I have to do or that I should do or that I could do, but just let myself be. So maybe that can be a nice practice uh, if you can find some time to do that for yourself or even just as Mary Oliver said, um, just to even revisit that little house of gratitude inside. Um, sometimes that's, sometimes we can't get to the woods. Sometimes we can just visit that little gratitude home in our hearts. And that can be, that can be enough. So thank you all for listening. I'd love your comments. If you liked this, click like, if you want to subscribe, click subscribe. And um, let me know what your thoughts were. Let me know what touched you in these poems. Let me know what inspired you, what provoked you. Um, I love hearing from you all. So have a wonderful and a blessed day.